what I'm going to do is uh, offer a review of, I think, what Nigel Edwards referred to as a 20-year experiment uh, of commissioning. Uh, you, uh, just drawing on some of the evidence we have, and yes, particularly on the new Nuffield Trust research uh, that we published just last week on the commissioning of care for people with long-term conditions. And we'll then just conclude with a, a few thoughts about where commissioning might be headed, which I hope will uh, inform the uh, panel debate that follows. So where have we got to so far with commissioning? I think it's actually 22 years, the anniversary just coming up. I mean, I think what we, <clears throat> we have to be absolutely clear about is that significant faith continues to be put in commissioning. It's actually a, a policy that's had a, a, a very... Uh, long uh, survival compared with uh, so many others. And this, it's clearly founded on this idea that commissioners can challenge providers and use contracts to bring about some kind of improvement in terms of service delivery. Uh, in in the, the uh, new policy arrangements, commissioning is being firmly put into the hands of clinicians through clinical commissioning groups. I think we have to be absolutely clear that it seems the intention is that this is going to have to work in a framework of choice and competition. But my question to you this morning is that is all of this a triumph of hope over experience? I think the evidence we have in terms of the performance of commissioning is quite clear that uh, well, commissioning has certainly struggled to shift care away from hospitals towards community settings in the way that we've seem to uh, uh, keep ex exhorting it to. Uh, we've got evidence, for example, from studies by the Audit Commission around that. It's also uh, been difficult to stem the uh, rise in emergency admissions, and uh, clearly commissioning has not been able to uh, reduce health inequalities in England. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, my colleague Natasha Curry and I uh, undertook a review of the evidence on commissioning over the, the new Labour years. This was for a, a book that uh, Nick Mays and Anna Dixon published uh, for the King's Fund. And in there, we, we, found, we identified certain achievements around public health, partnership working, improvements in primary care. But our overall conclusion when we looked at a whole range of research and other evidence was, as you can see here, that when weighed against the transaction costs of running a commissioning system, the verdict would seem to be weak or at best equivocal. Now, we've not been alone in reaching that sort of conclusion. The Health Select Committee in 2010, in its inquiry into commissioning, said weaknesses remain 20 years after the introduction of the purchase of provider split. Commissioners continue to be passive when to do their work efficiently. They must insist on quality, challenge the uh, inefficiencies of providers, particularly unevidenced variations in clinical practice. And in many ways, that sort of prefigures then what Robert Francis said in his uh, recent report about commissioning. The experience of Stafford shows an urgent need to rebalance and refocus commissioning into an exercise designed to procure fundamental and enhanced standards of services for patients, as well as to identify the nature of the service to be provided. So I think we're facing something of a challenge here. This is not a, a particularly encouraging uh, set of uh, evidence and uh, conclusions. But before just moving on to well, what might be the, the future prospects for commissioning, I'm not sure we actually have always known an awful lot about what it is that commissioners actually do, apart from it's presumably those people who are doing uh, commissioning. Um, and indeed, um, we at the Nuffield Trust, together with uh, colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, we um, uh, were successful in um, being awarded a research contract to do a two-year in-depth study of the practice of commissioning. This was about the commissioning of care for people with long-term conditions. And you can see we carried out this research over a particularly uh, interesting, um, some would say volatile period from uh, 2010 to 2012. We would argue for commissioning, it's actually quite typical to carry out research at a period of when it's being reorganized, so that that has some value in itself. Um, and we were looking at three primary care trust areas and their practice-based commissioners, and to say how they commissioned care for people with long-term conditions. Well, what did we find? We, we found commissioning 
Uh, we observed it to be a very labour-intensive activity. In fact, we talked about the labour of, of commissioning. And this labour was uh, characterised much more by relational work, um, by developing collaboration and consensus with providers, uh, running planning workshops, uh, events to specify services, much more by that sort of work than by harder edge or transactional activity. So we, we, we didn't see so much work in terms of, a, for example, using data to review and challenge existing services. We saw commissioners acting as the convener of the local health system, bringing people together to do this relational work. And we also saw them taking quite a strong role in seeing through the implementation of new services with providers. Now, this commissioning work we were observing was often focused on relatively marginal service changes. And we concluded that the effort involved in this uh, labour of commissioning didn't seem to us always to be proportionate to the actual improvements in services that were brought about. We also found that the commissioners often struggled to actually describe the outcomes they were seeking to achieve. And another interesting finding was that financial matters often seemed somewhat, somewhat peripheral to commissioning discussions. Or well, we certainly got a sense that the financial um, analysis and discussion was happening in parallel to the work of the, the commissioning clinicians and managers. And unsurprisingly, we also concluded that the effectiveness of commissioning is significantly hampered by periodic reorganisation. It's an average of every three to four years, I think, over the 22-year period. But let, let's, let's look forward. What's, uh, what does this mean for the future of commissioning? You recall yesterday Jennifer shared some of the uh, findings of the survey that, that we sent out to, to all of you uh, before, before the summit and the, the full results of that are on the Nuffield website. We're just going to, from, there were two particular questions about commissioning I wanted to draw your attention to. This one here was asking, um, will commissioning by clinical commissioning groups result in higher quality, more efficient healthcare than commissioning by PCTs today. Now, it was only actually a quarter who ag strongly agreed or tended to agree with that statement. However, when the question was, commissioning by clinical commissioning groups will, in two years' time, be more effective than PCTs in breaking down barriers between primary and secondary care, it was nearly half who agreed. So I think there's something interesting in that clearly confidence is lacking in terms of CCG's ability to secure higher quality and more efficient services, or at least within two years, which one would normally expect to be, I guess, the setup time for an, an organization. But there is optimism about their ability to bring about improvements in coordination of care across hospital uh, and community and general practice. Now, when you take that, albeit, I know it's a survey, of uh, relatively small numbers, but it's uh, some indication of, of, of confidence. If you take that alongside the evidence that we've got from our, our two-year study uh, where commissioners prefer relational and collaborative work, I think it raises some interesting questions about what we should want or expect of clinical commissioning groups. You know, should they actually focus on de developing integrated local delivery of care for long-term conditions, urgent care, children and older people. So very much services at that uh, primary care, secondary care interface. I think also, um, uh, within the, the final part of our research report, we, we also concluded that it's time to develop new and smarter arrangements that offer some different ways of sharing service and financial risk with providers. In one sense, you know, should we constantly be trying to develop this sort of pure purchaser-provider split when real in reality, local uh, clinical commissioners and providers are already working across that in some quite different ways? Do we need to line up the, the risk and incentives differently? And also, if commissioning is going to be really about quality as well as cost, we're going to need much richer and more timely data, both quantitative and qualitative. And that can actually really play, I think, to the strength of local clinicians in leading the planning and funding of care. So the two questions I kind of, I guess, hand over in one sense to the, the panel now are, 
Now, is the CCG going to be almost like more of a local service development and improvement organisation? Or I guess, the, you know, the other side of that, or, or is it actually the sort of uh, insurer purchaser for, for, for uh, acute and other, other services? Or is it somehow a mixture of both? But how's it going to do this? If it's going to do this more relational service development to work, how's it actually going to do that when it's going to be required to shape a local NHS market through the use of contracts? I leave those questions there and now uh, delighted to uh, hand over to colleagues who are going to debate this further in our panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, right. uh, good morning and uh, welcome to this session. I'm uh, very pleased to have two people who have been in the uh, hot seat this week and will continue to be so uh, for, I suspect, uh, some time to come uh, with us. Uh, Bruce Keogh, uh, as everybody knows, is the medical director of the uh, NHS uh, and the NHS uh, commissioning board. And David Behan is the new-ish uh, head of the uh, Care Quality Commission. And I thought what we would do to get the uh, conversation going would be to focus on the three themes that I think probably should provide the main priorities for the National Commissioning Board and CQC over the next uh, several months. Uh, firstly, showing that they are decisively on the side of uh, patients, uh, particularly around compassion and dignity and quality of care. Uh, secondly, uh, demonstrating uh, that they are able to provide effective support for clinical leadership uh, throughout the system, in particular the uh, 211 new clinical commissioning groups that kick off in just a few weeks' time. And then uh, thirdly, getting serious about the more fundamental job of service redesign and future-proofing the system rather than just uh, relying on the uh, current salami slicing and pay freezes as the way of dealing with what will be the second phase of austerity. So I think those are the kind of three themes that one would be looking to the uh, commissioning board and CQC to be uh, pursuing. Uh, so Bruce, I'm going to start with you. Um, obviously, this week, uh, a lot of focus on the response to the uh, Francis report on Mid-Staffordshire and a debate about the extent to which uh, that was a unique occurrence or may also reflect uh, standards of care in some other institutions across the NHS. Uh, you've been tasked with reviewing 14 other uh, hospital trusts. Can you tell us where that has got to and when you will be able to tell the public what the results of that investigation looks like? Okay, can I, can I just open the discussion by saying that there's been a lot of focus on the 14 hospitals that, uh, that I'm going to be reviewing. But there are many more <laughs> hospitals than that in our National Health Service. And many people are simply being ground down by what seemed to be a relentless attack on people who are really trying to do a good job in our NHS at the moment, whether they be managers, nurses, doctors. And one of the things that I would like to perhaps come out of today or subsequently come out of, of my review is actually recognition of the fact that our NHS is still something we should be very proud of. And we have objective evidence of that from a sister organization, if you like, of the Nuffield Trust, the, the Commonwealth Fund studies that have gone on. We know that there are problems with every healthcare system in the world. And Robert Francis's review has really taken the lid off some horrendous issues which get to the heart of, of if you like, the patient or customer service and compassionate aspect of our NHS. So I'll, I'll just say that as a start because um, I will be looking at the Prime Minister's request at hospitals which have the highest mortality in this country as measured by two measures. One is the hospital standardized mortality ratio and the other is the standardized hospital mortality indicator. And they are two indicators. They're a bit like the consumer price index or the retail price index. They measure something similar but not quite the same. And I've tried to keep that to a manageable size so the 
criteria which, um, which I chose was to say hospitals that have been statistical outliers on both of those measures for two years in a row. Now, that's created a, a list of 14 hospitals. Um, I don't want to get into any debates about the statistical methodology that's been used to identify those. That is, for me, not the issue. The issue is, are those hospitals um, providing good care within the domains of quality? In other words, are they providing effective care? Are they providing safe care? And are they providing decent care? That, and it was the decency bit that was strikingly absent in, in some parts of uh, of Stafford. And to do that, we're, we're going to use some mechanisms which have recently been developed um, in conjunction with, uh, with uh, other colleagues through the National Quality Board, such as uh, the CQC, <coughs> Monitor, and others. And the, the first approach will be to do a rapid review of those hospitals. And that will start with very experienced clinicians, experienced managers, patient representatives, and junior doctors going in on an announced visit to each of those hospitals for 48 hours to glean information. They will have been fed by a, a, a large amount of data which will give them key lines of inquiry for that visit. And then there will be two subsequent unannounced follow-up visits to those hospitals. The the information that's gleaned from those visits will be brought together in what's called a risk summit. And a risk summit is a summit which will be called by the, uh, uh, chaired by the regional director of the commissioning board. We'll have around the table Health Education England, Care Quality Commission, Monitor, local authority and other interested parties to look and see whether those hospitals do genuinely have a problem. If they have a problem, are they on the right trajectory for improvement? And if they aren't on the right trajectory for improvement, what help can be given? So I anticipate that the improvement process will begin from the moment the rapid response teams go in to see, uh, to see those, those hospitals. At the end, we still have to determine this, and it's on Monday that the, the advisory group are advising me on this uh, on meeting. Um, we will have to start thinking about what the end product of this will be. What I don't want the end product to be is just a list of bad things. I want the end product to be a series of lessons and a demonstration that where we have found efficiencies that we've put um, remediable measures in place. So I would envisage one option is that um, as the reports emerge, they will feed into a, um, into a higher level report, which at the end will have lessons for Monitor, lessons for the CQC, lessons for the Commissioning Board, lessons for others. Another important point, which um, I know is close to your heart, is, is the issue of transparency. So as the data becomes available to the teams, that information will go up on a website for public scrutiny. Um, it's my view that too often many of these issues have been conducted under a kind of a, a shroud of secrecy where wise people come up with some conclusion. Um, but, you know, the NHS is owned by the citizens of this country. They have a vested interest, particularly in the kind of turbulent times we're in at the moment, to understand how we make our judgments and on what evidence we base them. So the key thing is we'll be kicking off with uh, um, in the next few weeks. I envisage it'll probably take four months by the time we've been through these uh, reviews because they need to be detailed, they need to be thorough, they need to withstand a significant level of scrutiny in the current environment, um, and they need to be trustworthy. So it will take a while, and it'll be conducted in a transparent environment. Thank you. Going forward, David, I think the Care Quality Commission is the body that has been tasked with ensuring that fundamental standards are being met across the NHS, or at least measuring uh, the extent to which they are and uh, speaking without fear or favor based on what you find. The Care Quality Commission is, I think, now the fourth incarnation of an institution designed to do this uh, about once every three years. Uh, it seems that that function is abolished and uh, replaced with something else. How long will you last? 
Um, well, I'm in this for the long haul. Um, I think we've got to stop um, pulling these plants up to see if they're growing and then stuffing them back into the ground again. And I think one of the things about successful organisations is they've been given chance to endure and uh, mature and grow into the role that they've been given. Um, so we're planning uh, to be here for a while, uh, but we're also planning to change the way that we've inspected hospitals and health. Um, we've begun to set out these plans. Uh, I spoke about this yesterday in one of the uh, smaller groups. Um, we're clear that we'll look at um, four domains in relation to quality. Um, are services safe? Um, are they effective? Uh, how do people experience them? And they're the domains that Aradoz has set out in his uh, review. Uh, I know the commissioning board are using those and other colleagues are using those. So that will be our opportunity to get some uh, coordination and coherence between the kind of distributed leadership that exists at the present time. Uh, but we will add to that looking at the leadership and culture of an organisation because we know that that makes such a difference. And as Robert Francis highlighted in his report, but uh, you know, as many know, um, the culture and leadership of an organisation, how open and transparent it is, is one of the keys to whether, as Bruce has just said, that organisation is going to learn and actually grow and improve. Uh, so we're planning to be around for a while. We will change what we've been doing. I think we've been looking at the wrong things uh, when it comes to looking at health, and we need to change those. And that's the job that we're busy getting on and doing. Is one of the observations of the last decade or so that actually there's a fundamental mismatch between what the public and the politicians want of your body and what the NHS wants, which is that the NHS, generally speaking, prefers a kind of softer improvement focus, and the politicians and the public want a combination of Ofsted and the Civil Aviation Authority uh, to uh, do the equivalent of a kind of certificate of airworthiness and a set of Ofsted-style ratings. I think it's a really good question, uh, Simon, and I think, I think this debate has been too theological for too long, and um, the challenge, I don't know if Stephen Dorrell's still here, but uh, that St yeah, he is, that uh, Stephen has given CQC now over, well, uh, the past couple of years or so, is are we clear enough about our purpose? And um, we've been out to consult on this over the past um, four months or so, and um, we'll issue something in April where I hope we can say quite clearly and ambiguously, uh, our role is to ensure that the services that people receive uh, are safe and of a high quality. So we will focus on these issues about safety. I think that was the spirit of um, uh, the recommendations that Robert Francis made in, in relation to it. Uh, we think we will do that so that services can improve, but we are not an improvement agency. So we'll be absolutely clear in relation to that. Um, in order to do that though, we actually um, need to be clear. And to your point, um, I, I've said since I took this job, uh, we will be on the side of people using services. So if it comes to a dilemma of which side of the fence do we fall off on, to uh, the services or to people, it's to people using services every single time. So we'll build our methodologies and our approach based on uh, the experiences of people that are using services and um, arrive at judgments which do look at, as I've said, the culture and leadership, the effectiveness of these services work, but actually we'll do that from the perspective through the lens of people that are using services. Um, I think uh, that's how uh, Ofsted is probably the most recognised brand for parents. I, get ev I guess every body that's had school-aged <coughs> children has been on Ofsted's website, particularly when it comes to choosing schools. Um, you know, the Guardian on the Saturday, uh, would you like to live here, uh, always use the Ofsted ratings. One of my ambitions for the work we do in CQC will be that those judgments uh, around uh, hospitals that we arrive at are also a part of that and are recognised as being something that we do. I think, sadly, the public are not aware of who we are at the present time. And part of our consultation, I think Michelle Mitchell's here from Edge UK. We asked Edge UK to get 12 uh, older people so we could speak with them about what we do. And uh, they did arrange a group of 12 people in um, Bury St Edmunds and not one of them had heard of us. Well, the key issue for that for me is that every single one of those people will use health and care services. 
And that's not uh, a tolerable position. We actually need to raise our profile so people are clear who we are, what we do, and our information needs to be available to them so it can inform on social care their choice, but um, in lots of healthcare services, uh, the transparency of that. So uh, we will uh, push into that space. I think on the Civil Aviation Authority point, Simon, it's interesting. One of the things that have been occupying my thoughts uh, a great deal is um, I think uh, things will go wrong in hospitals. Um, the issue for me is not whether as a regulator we can uh, identify and then intervene. Uh, the issue for me is whether we can identify whether a, a, a service is an open system that is going to learn from that. So it's not that things go wrong, it's what happens when things go wrong and do they uh, take that, um, analyse what has happened uh, and then learn and improve from it. And one of my reflections is that I think we... Uh, um, can cr I don't want to create a system whereby um, something goes wrong, we're notified and the reaction is a regulatory response. I think I want to, uh, s and this is why the leadership and culture part of what we do is important. I think there needs to be a judgment about whether this is an open organisation, whether it's learning and it's, it's um, uh, improving by uh, the way that it operates. Now that's a really difficult thing to tease out uh, and certainly um, what I've been doing is speaking to um, chief execs of uh, large hospitals, um, lots of different people about how we might do that and, and just think a way through that. And now this is early thinking, but it seems to me that um, what Robert Francis was saying in his report is that there wasn't a culture of openness in mid-staffs. And um, yeah, I know other hospitals, top performing hospitals, where something uh, does go wrong, a serious untoward incident in every event. And what distinguishes the two is uh, how they deal with it. I think there's these issues around, I don't know what's happened at Bolton, but issues around Bolton at the present time about how open people have been. And um, I think we need to think that through because um, it is important, I think, that um, we're able to assess the culture and leadership of organisations and how open they are and not whether something's gone wrong. And I think the annual staff survey is one good pointer in that respect. I mean, the fact that only 55% of NHS staff think that if there was a serious uh, act of malpractice or a uh, problem in their local institution, that local management would take that seriously, you know, whether that's an accurate perception or not. I mean, that presumably tells you that there is a set of change required in a number of our institutions. I think that's absolutely right. And uh, staff surveys, uh, surveys by people using services, uh, how complaints are dealt with, um, uh, are all indicators that we don't currently look at, but I think are a valuable source of trying to assess how open and transparent the culture is in an organisation and how the governance is supporting that openness and transparency in the way an organisation works. Changing gears slightly, this is a pretty complex uh, superstructure that's been put on top of the NHS with the NHS Commissioning Board, the Care Quality Commission, Monitor, you collectively, uh, the three of you and various other organisations as well, have got a stewardship responsibility for trying to reduce complexity, confusion, overlap, uh, gaps, uh, as experienced by patients and by local clinicians and leaders in the system. How are you working together as uh, the tripartite leaders of the NHS to do that? Do you want okay. to deal with that? Well, I think I've met and spoken to David yeah. Bennett three times this week um, in different places at different times. I know, uh, I think our teams have spoken every single day this week on distress and failure work, uh, also with David Flores' uh, team. Um, so I think at both chief executive level, we're meeting uh, very regularly. That's both formally and informally to make sure that uh, we're aligned in terms of what we're doing. Um, I referred earlier to actually having consistent definitions of quality. There's important conversations going on about the data that's being used to inform that and whether there can be common data sets. Um, so uh, we have systems leaders meetings which bring the chief executives together of those organisations and there's say a sequence of bilateral conversations that are going on. So I probably spend in 15% of my working week in those kind of conversations with other agencies um, to make sure that we've got 
the synergies between uh, what we do that we're sharing, not just the detail of the work that's going on, but our thinking and the, the way we're approaching it. Uh, for me, tone and style are important aspects of how we need to um, uh, conduct our business. Uh, and my view is we're working very hard to do that and uh, staff across our organisations are also doing that. Um, but it's hard going. We're all changing and developing organisations at the same time as we're delivering services. At the same time, we're working out what the interrelationships are. So uh, from a personal level, I've never worked as hard in my life. Bruce? When Aradazi was uh, doing his review, uh, a number of people reported in. At that time, Sheila Leatherman put forward an idea for a quality framework, which included the, uh, the concept of a, of a national quality board because it seemed clear that in our system up to that time there was no place where the regulators, so monitors, CQC, uh, the Department of Health and other parties sat down and actually talked. And the, the quality board was, an, was established to try and address those issues. Since then, there have been more players on the pitch, in particular Health Education England. That board will continue, and um, it's a place where each party holds the other to account for its contribution to the quality of care, and also issues. You raised the important issue of these organizations should deal with the complexity and pass on simplicity. There's no historical precedent for that in the NHS. <laughs> Um, so that is a big problem that we have to deal with. But we can start with, um, with quality. And I think the quality board now has reached a stage of maturity where, um, where we are prepared to hold each other to account and have some quite difficult conversations. So that, I think, is where there's going to be, I think, what Don Berwick called the some pool sovereignty in, in our uh, health service with respect to quality. So. I, I think there's potential there that we can use. Mm -hmm. One of the obvious uh, necessities for the commissioning board is you take uh, control of 96 billion pounds of public money in three weeks' time is not to try and spend that in a series of checks issued from Leeds, but instead to ensure that the 211 clinical commissioning groups are actually able to deliver on their promise. How are you empowering local GPs clinical leaders uh, to uh, deliver on the potential that that model offers? I think that's quite a, a, a difficult question. So the, we're doing our best to give, the, uh, to give the GPs freedom. I think what still niggles at me and worries, is, worries me is that the cold wind of financial accountability will introduce a, um, a level of rigor which might inadvertently stifle some of the innovation that we're actually trying uh, to create. And that, and that is an issue which we discuss on, on a regular basis. I know it's an issue of concern for, um, for many CCGs. But you know, if we, if we as a commissioning board fail to give the clinical commissioning groups their freedom, then much of the structural change that we've been through at the moment will have, um, um, have been of no value. And I'm really encouraged by the level of clinical leadership that I see, the ambition for, um, for change, the ambition for um, for driving quality in a way that has perhaps um, not been there before. Um, you know, one, one of the things that the commissioning groups do is they know, they know every street in their area, they know their wards, they know the needs of the local population. What I think we're trying to encourage is that, um, that they work very closely with other parties such as the local authorities, you know, the health and wellbeing boards and all the other structures that you'll be well familiar with um, to ensure that they give um, a degree of, of local flavor to the services that they, that they deliver. But your point is, is very well taken, and I think CCGs will be watching us very closely to see that we deliver on that promissory note. 
So before we open up to uh, some comments and observations from the audience, let me just uh, ask you about the kind of third of the kind of key priorities, uh, it seems to me, which is to get seriously going on the service redesign and the future proofing, particularly of care for frail elderly people, people with multiple chronic conditions. Work that the Nuffield Trust has just published shows that if the current trends in age sex standardized hospital admission rates for adults with chronic disease continue in the second half of the decade, uh, then that will pile on probably another uh, six to nine billion uh, pounds worth of pressure and require a 20% increase in the number of uh, hospital uh, beds. So getting that piece right is absolutely essential for ensuring that not only is care provided of a high quality standard, but also that the NHS is uh, financially sustainable. Uh, what is it going to take to do that, uh, David? Well, I'll let Bruce do the commissioning bit of that, but I think um, uh, um, I think that's absolutely so. I think services um, are currently um, trying to work out how to accommodate people with multiple comorbidities, and they're essentially older people. And I think the issue is not just about what the NHS is going to do in that respect, Simon. We're a regulator that looks across social care as well. And um, I, I think this point that Bruce made around the local relationships with local authorities through health and wellbeing boards is absolutely critical to this because um, it can't just be an NHS solution to the problem that you've identified. It needs to be a solution which is across uh, health and care. I would also argue that housing needs to play a role in that as well if it's about maintaining people in their own, uh, in their own homes. So as we move forward, one of the things as we're looking at what we do and how we do it and how we design our own organisation, uh, what the role of the Chief Inspector uh, of Hospitals is going to be, it's not just how we can look at the institutions, but how we can look across at patient pathways as well, uh, the way that people live their lives and what their lived reality is, because actually the issue of people with, co people with multiple comorbidities is very often the individual clinical transaction is, as Bruce said, of a very, very high standard. People are doing uh, quite impressive work. Um, the issue, though, is that when they're referred to somebody else in another hospital or in another building or another town, and it's at those transition points that it begins to break down. And I think that's why people's experience of services needs to be uh, a part of what we look at, because that um, is a hugely important uh, dimension uh, to the work. So we will think about how we can look at uh, services for people with dementia across an area as well as just looking at uh, services in a particular uh, hospital or in a particular care home so we can actually look at that patient pathway. Thank you. Bruce. I mean, David, I think, has answered most of it, but it also plays in a little bit into your previous question. So given that local commissioning groups are closest to their population, it's the job of the commissioning board not to <coughs> tell CCGs what to do, but to help them to do what they know they need, um, they need to do. And one of, the, one of the worries I have is that we're in, we're in a potential for a, for a vicious circle with um, pressures on primary care, heaping pressures on hospitals, and then the, the um, uh, the business base of the of social services falling. We see there isn't as much money in social services if they fail. And I think it's a point that Julie Moore made earlier today, that if um, if there are more people coming into your hospital and you can't get people out of your hospital because you don't have decent community care, there is a problem. And the people that can help to solve that are the people on the ground, um, the the clinical commissioning groups working with their local authorities and uh, and others to to try and prevent us getting into that awful that awful scenario.